All right, today it's the top 30 RODI fails. You heard it right, 30. We're gonna go rapid fire. <laughs> There's so many mistakes out there. I bet you most of you have made like at least 15 of these. <laughs> so they have it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but we've been in the business of RO for a long time and we have learned a lot from our mistakes. And we're, today we're gonna teach you what those are. All right, so this I probably did wrong for the first 10 years of reefing, uh, and then I found out. Yeah, the mistake here is uh, not realizing that the TDS probe inline needs to be placed properly in the fitting. In order for it to work properly, water has to pass through the goalpost for it to get an electrical conductivity reading. And uh, if you didn't open it up, you wouldn't even know that you had it wrong in the first place. So you should probably go check, just look at yours <laughs> and make sure it's installed correctly and uh, just give it a 90 degree turn if it isn't. Yeah. But again, the water needs to pass through the post. If it is in parallel, it's just gonna give you the wrong reading. So if you're getting a three and you think it's zero or you're getting a zero and you think it's three, that might be the reason why. So go ahead and check it uh, in the instructions or even on their, their website, but you'll see the actual like, yep. little documentation on how to do it. But uh, the water, when you pull it out, should obviously be going through the two goalposts on the electrode, not parallel to it. Okay, so closely related to that is number two here. Yeah, this is uh, that the TDS probe needs the T-fitting in order for it to work properly. So it's not one that you can just dip in a bucket of water and, and get a proper reading. Yeah, you cannot take this probe out of the T <laughs> and dip it and expect to get an accurate reading. That's because they calibrate them through the T and the T absolutely changes the fittings or mm -hmm. the readings rather. And I know this because I went through a whole lot of troubleshooting before checking with HM Digital and then they told me afterward that it's calibrated that yeah. way and it absolutely changes the reading. So you cannot use this probe outside of the fitting to get an accurate reading. All right, so number three is a fairly new thing. Yeah, the mistake here is uh, not taking full advantage of RO tubing clips. So Neat Aquatics has singles, doubles, triples, quadruples. I mean, if you really want to spice up your uh, RODI looking lines and make them look just fan, I mean, they have clips uh, for the valves, clips for the hoses, clips for the fittings, and it just makes it look really nice. A friend of mine once said, a clean install ah. is a safe install, yeah. right? And I totally agree with that. So if you can route all these perfect, uh, you can make sure that there's no bends, they don't get caught on anything when you're opening a door, taking other equipment out. Uh, it does look clean and obviously it can be used for like RO or not just RO uh, applications, but also for dosing lines. Oh yeah. But there's clips for uh, the, the ball valve, there's clips for everything so you can route it nice and clean. All right, so number four is something I've gotten a lot of phone calls over the years about. Yeah, the mistake here is assuming that your well water is uh, better or you know less contaminated than your city water, and barring some disinfectants, could actually be worse, something that you found out this last year. Yeah, you know, it's not better or worse. Yeah. You just never know. Yeah. It could be just your area. It could have arsenic in it. It can have copper in it. It can have any metal or anything that's in the water, in your ground. It can have phosphate in it. It can have nitrate and silica, super common. Yeah. It can have you know, uh, or herbicides and pesticides from farm runoff. So whatever's in your area can actually be in the groundwater as well. So just think about it when you're putting that in. And related to that actually is another question, which is, you know, do I need to use carbon blocks on mm. well water because I don't have disinfectants? And the answer is yes, because all those herbicides and pesticides or anything else that's in the water, it's going to help remove those as well. All right, so number five. Pretty closely related to that. The direct inverse, actually, and that's assuming that your tap water is better than well water. And again, here, you know, we're talking about you know, well waters having these massive aquifers that cover maybe three, four different states, uh, but then treated locally by your city. And some cities use higher amounts of disinfectants than others, so it's worth checking. Yeah, uh, you never really know. And like, so in Minneapolis here, we kind of like are dependent on how clean the Mississippi River is at yeah, the time. True. Uh, you know, so it changes all the time. So one of the really big things here is city water versus, or municipal supply mm. water rather, versus well water really doesn't make a difference. Every single one of these water supplies is different. And just knowing that one single thing really doesn't have an impact on the quality of the water for sure. Okay, so number six goes against what most people think, for sure. <laughs> yeah, the mistake is uh, assuming that low TDS just means high quality water from, you know, from your tap, like Minneapolis, 130 TDS coming out of our tap. 
but not necessarily the, 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 mo the cleanest water because there's other things in there that don't register as TDS. Yeah, so most of it is actually things we don't want. Yeah. Uh, even just uh, the 100 TDS, there's, like, yeah. there's 10 parts per million silica in there. There's three parts per, mil per million uh, uh, chlorine. There's almost one part per million ammonia in the water. Hmm. And so when you add it up, like 20% of what's in there, we really don't want to have in the tank. Converse to that is at my house, I have 500 parts per million uh, TDS water. Yeah. But uh, most of that's just like bicarbonate and calcium. So like not as dangerous to the tank, I still wanna strip that stuff out, but it doesn't really mean low TDS, doesn't mean better, because some of those things are actually really detrimental to the tank. All right, so number seven is something I was told to do wrong from the beginning. I probably did it wrong for the first few years until I learned how to do this better. Yeah, the mistake on this one is changing out your DI canister after it starts to register as TDS on the outline. So, you know, that TDS could be made up of a whole bunch of things you don't want in your tank, ammonia, silica, and there is a really easy fix so you can catch it uh, before monitoring the whole color change. Add a second canister. Yeah, so here's the deal is instinct says I want to get the most life out oh, yeah. of it, right? And so I'll use it until I get one and one's no big deal. Wrong. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is because it isn't just a mix of calcium and carbonate or bicarbonate at that point. It's actually whatever this cartridge had the least affinity for, and it creates little bands that get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so at the top, the least affinity is usually ammonia. Mm -mm. And then the second one is often silica. And really, the, a lot of the things we don't want in the tank the most are actually have the weakest affinity. And so it creates that band, and you're purging ammonia. Then you want one or two or three parts per million ammonia going into the tank. You don't mm -hmm. want that. So make sure to change it before it gets to the top, maybe a half inch. And if you're not real careful about it, as Randy said, have two DI resins yep. because the second one will catch it, and you don't have to worry about it as much. All right, so number eight, I actually saw a post on this on Ask Beers TV yesterday. Yeah, I saw the same one, and it's letting your sediment filter get completely clogged, dark, caked, all the way through where you think you're doing some good, but actually the reduction in pressure means reduction in efficiency. Yeah, so you might have thought, well, hey, man, I got a lot of money out of this when I let it get that caked. It's not true. Uh, <laughs> what, what you did is actually allow the sediment fill or the carbon blocks after it to get clogged too early, hmm. which are way more expensive. This is just a few dollars. Yeah. Some of those things can be as much as 20 bucks. So if you got $40 in filters, but uh, you wasted to save the $3 filter, no good. But more importantly than that is often the fact that when this gets clogged, the pressure goes down, yeah. the performance of the RO membrane goes down, meaning you get a lot more wastewater, and you actually have a way lower rejection rate, which means that you're sending higher TDS water into your DI resin mm -hmm. and consuming that much faster, which is also more expensive. So this little few dollar filter will actually change the performance of all of them and something that you should change out more frequently and not let it just get completely caked and clog the system. All right, so number nine, also related to pressure. Yeah, this uh, mistake is letting your pressure get under 50 PSI. 50 PSI is that operating range where you're going to get a balance of, you know, efficiency, wastewater through and whatnot through. But if you allow that to get, like your sediment filter, to get clogged and lower that pressure, you're degrading the efficiency the rest of the way through. Uh, but this is something that we did a thorough BST, BRSTV Investigates test on where more pressure equaled better efficiency. Mm -hmm. So if you go down to like 30 PSI, you may see like, you know, only 85% rejection, which means you're just burning through DI resin, yeah. wastewaters through like through the nose. And you're also probably instead of 75 gallons a day producing like 15. Yeah. So it really, really goes down fast when you go below 50. You know, 40 or 45 is about the threshold of where I wouldn't go any lower, mm. but a booster pump can actually get you water faster. It will increase the efficiency of the system. It will reduce DI resin consumption and often pay for itself really fast. But if you go even higher than 50, you can see all of the performance metrics scale up. And if you wanna see that BRS TV investigates on it, just search for the pressure in RODI. All right, so number 10, probably should have been number one. Mistake is not using a float valve. $12 piece of equipment we've harped on throughout all of anything, anytime we talk about RODI, to save your floors. Yeah, so uh, there's two camps here. One, you bought it from the beginning and you never flooded your floor. <laughs> or two, you didn't and you did. Uh, everybody that doesn't use a float valve will eventually flood their floor. So don't be that person. You can just buy the float valve and instead of trying to remember when to come back hours later to yeah. turn it off, it will do it for you. 
All right, so number 11, something I've also seen a million phone calls on. Yeah, the mistake is testing your TDS immediately after you turn on the system. And uh, it's just TDS creep, and all of us who have heard about it and you're wondering what it is, basically, if you come back in five, 10 minutes, the TDS will be leveled out, and uh, then take your reading. Yeah, so when water sits inside the membrane here, it will balance out with zero on one side or one and 100 on the other. A long enough timeline, it'll be 50-50. Yep. Uh, so it's not surprising that when you turn it on, it's actually 10 TDS right to begin with, and it will slowly go down. So make sure you give it 10 minutes or so before you take your first reading. All right, so number 12 is actually something we sell a solution for, but I don't think we should. <laughs> the mistake is uh, attempting to calibrate your TDS meter, and we just told you in mistake one and two that this thing only works one way, and that's in a fitting and turned a specific way, in which case you're not going to get a uh, proper reading trying to calibrate it in a bottle. Yeah, so a lot of people will buy the little calibration solution. I think it says like 300 some mm. TDS on it and then dip it in there assuming that that is going to give an accurate reading. And it doesn't. Worse yet, they calibrate to that and it will give you the impression it did, yeah. but it did not. Mm. So it's not reading that right. And if you read the instructions for it, you actually need to put it back in the fitting to get an actual reading and find a way to get water or the solution to actually flow through the fitting uh -huh. to calibrate it right. This is a little bit more, more complex than most people are going to do. In fact, uh, if accuracy is really important, getting a new TDS meter is probably a better bet mm -hmm. because most likely you're going to hurt the accuracy of the reading by calibrating more than perfect it. All right, so number 13, we sell kits for this uh, mm -hmm. because it's just the way that people do it. Yeah. But you probably shouldn't. Yeah, the mistake here is changing the sediment filter and the carbon blocks at the same time, and, and inherently I want to change them all if you give me a kit, but they don't wear out the same. No, they don't. So I'd say 90% of people do. They change all the filter, filters at once, yeah. maybe not the DI resin. It's just not the way to do it. So change out the sediment filter as it gets clogged. You should have a uh, pressure gauge on the system that goes after the uh, sediment filter. Mm -hmm. If you see the pressure go down, it's because it got clogged, change it out. The carbon blocks have a totally different life structure on yep. them. And if you have chlorine like or chloramines like most people do, you can actually just test it with a little chlorine strip and find out if it's still pulling out all of the disinfectant. But other than that, there's also volumizers to figure out how much water's flowed through it. Yeah. But they don't actually wear out at the same rate, so you can actually replace them at different times. All right, so number 14, this used to be kind of rare, but not really anymore. No, it's uh, not considering the upgrade kits for the water savers. So basically just adding on a second RO membrane. So 75 and 75, 100 and 100, in some cases 150, 150. But effectively what you're trying to do is save water and that means more water production. Yeah, so I don't know anybody who doesn't want twice as fast water, yeah. uh, and I don't know anybody who doesn't want to reduce the amount of wastewater they're producing as well. Yep. And you can do that with a second membrane. And the way that this works is you're gonna feed the wastewater out of the first membrane into the feed of the second membrane, mm -hmm. And that might not sound like, like a great idea. However, if you only have 100 TDS water to begin with, the wastewater from this one will be about 120. And so really not a big deal to feed it into that one. In fact, you get a lot of efficiency gains. All right, so number 15, I bet you it's something that only about 10% of reefers know. Yeah, the mistake is uh, not considering two carbon blocks instead of one, and that just comes down to the efficiency thing again, too, where you know they have a lifespan, and over that course of that lifespan, they start to let a little chlorine, maybe some chloramines through, and why not have a second one there to capture what it's letting through, effectively you know, extending the life of the first one. Yeah, when you see a filter, you just assume it's 100% efficient. Yeah. And the reality is they're not, and they will over time start to leak some through. So a lot of the carbon blocks out there, actually the end of life is rated when it allows 50% of the disinfectant through, which is obviously not a standard that we want. Maybe that's okay for drinking water, mm -hmm. but it's not okay for the reef tank. And so with something like the universal block, it's actually rated for only 15% breakthrough. But even then, when you have two, it actually takes the 15% from here and brings it down to zero, even when this one is fully depleted. Yep. So it allows you to really get the maximum life out of the first filter and eventually actually save money. All right, so number 16, I bet you only 5% of reefers know, maybe even less. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the mistake of not realizing that carbon blocks actually recharge themselves during those intermittent off times. So, 
you know, as soon as I turn the system on, getting great efficiency out of my carbon block, and then it slowly de depletes over time. But, you know, when I shut, my, shut it off and come back to it, I'll probably get just as good efficiency right in the beginning. Yeah, so off cycles actually do increase performance when you go to turn it back on. Mm. So the takeaway from this is that if you do test your carbon blocks with say a chlorine strip, yeah. don't test it like right when you turn it on. Test it near when your bin is almost all the way full to get the most accurate depiction of when to change out your blocks. All right, so number 17 was actually something I considered with my first system, mm. but ultimately avoided. Yeah, this is making the mistake of buying a used system, and specifically as it relates to you know, the filters. Automatically, my mind says I should probably just change out all the filters, but it goes beyond just you know not trusting whether the filters are fresh, brand new, and whether they still have life left in them. Yeah, so a used system has almost always been sitting around somebody's garage for years and absolutely all of the filters need to be changed. Right. So after you do the math on how much all those filters cost, and then also that most of the seals are probably dried up too and they need lubrication or to be replaced, mm. it's just not worth it. And in most cases, it's always better to just buy a brand new system than it is to try to revive something that's been sitting around for a long time. All right, so number 18, something that really isn't very common here in Minnesota, but is in other states. Yeah, the warmer climates, I just, I can put my RO system outside and hook it to the garden hose. The, the mistake here is letting it hit direct sunlight because there are things that can grow algae in, in your water, and this is clear, sunlight goes through it, automatic uh, algae farm. Yeah, if you have nitrogen or ammonia or phosphorus in your water and uh, you have sunlight, you will grow algae in these systems and you absolutely don't want that. And really that goes for any light source, not just sunlight. Mm. Make sure that you install it in a dark area to get best performance. All right, so number 19, I have seen this one in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, this is the opposite of that, and that's putting your RO system somewhere where it can freeze. So I've seen this in people's garages, uh, and specifically those that don't have heated garages or warm enough to keep the water from freezing. But even some of those longer uh, lines, uh, RODI lines that run into your house or under the basement or what have you, it can freeze right up. And here's the thing, is you may think that your uh, garage is most of the time warm enough. Yeah. However, somebody just opens up the garage door and leaves it open one day, Whoops. boom, freezes <laughs> and bursts all over the place. It is a never ending water supply at that point that is just spilling all over mm. your house or garage. So you don't want that. So never put this where there's any chance that it could freeze. All right, so number 20, this is kind of like a next level reefer kind of thing to do, but it is a mistake to not think about. Yeah, the mistake is uh, not considering the value of single bed resins. So most of them, if they're not the Pro Series, come with you know a mixed bed resin, both cation and anion in there, but they deplete at different rates, which you know if you're trying to solve a very specific water problem, separating those out can actually save you money down the road. Yeah, so the reason that they're sold mixed like this is actually it performs really well and it's really easy. Just watch the uh, color change go to the top and it gets the top throw away and you have no problem. Mm. However, there's probably a lot of uh, the cation resin still charged in there that just gets kind of thrown out and wasted. Yeah. So if you do them separate and just do the cation first and the anion resin after that, what will allow you to do is only replace each one when it's fully depleted and you'll probably get twice the life out of your cation resin. For real. All right, so number 21 is kind of like a DIY pro tip to save a bunch of money. Uh, a lot of people out there are buying specialized cartridges just for silica mm. and they cost a lot more money than just doing it yourself. Yeah, and that's the mistake is not doing it yourself because, you know, we talked about mixed bed or separating them out. But we can get the best of both worlds by combining mixed bed with a little sliver of anion and you've got a silica cartridge. Yeah, so a lot of the silica removal cartridges, and if you have a really big problem with silica, low pH water mm. is actually commonly associated with that. So just put an inch or two of the anion resin at the bottom and you now have your silica removal DI resin at maybe a third the cost. All right, so number 22, if you don't like flushing, this is the solution for you. <laughs> yeah, the mistake is you already bought the booster pump kit. Just go ahead and get the auto flush because it's just an extra tool in your tool bag uh, and I don't have to remember to turn the valve off and on. Yeah, so if you wanted to do it just on its own, you'd have to go buy the power brick. You'd have to buy mm. all the little components for it. But if you already have a booster pump on there, you most likely have all the tools you need and it's just a low cost little auto flush system. You can pop right in there and it does all of your flushing for you. 
All right, so number 23 is super quick, but don't do this. Yeah, I've done it myself, and that's using knife and scissors to try to cut the RO tubing. You really need a clean cut. That 45 angled or mangled end of the RO tubing just leads to leaks. When you use anything to push it through, like a scissors or a knife, it gets little uh, bits in the end, mm. and you can hurt the O-ring inside of the fitting, and it could leak over time. Just don't get the little uh, tube cutter, cutter. It's only a few bucks. It'll make a nice 45 degree angle. It's clean and you'll be leak free. All right, so number 24 is just kind of where I ended up after using all of them. Yeah, the mistake here is not using Murloc fittings. And this is something that you, you know, we realized way early on in making RO systems that a high quality fitting makes a high quality product, in which case double O-rings is better than single O-rings when it comes to preventing leaks. Yeah, so the double O-rings allows a little bit of pressure to end up on the fitting, go in one wet direction or another. Just makes a much easier to use, leak-free solution for a fitting and makes a really big difference to me because one little leak on any of this stuff can do a lot of damage to your house. All right, so number 25, I am willing to use them, but I'm not willing to trust them. And rightly so, because the mistake here is trusting RODI solenoids, and that's a piece of moving, or, you know, a moving piece of equipment inside, on off, on off, hundreds and thousands of times, maybe a year, in which case it is prone to fail. Yeah, they will fail. They rarely last more than a year, and it is the kind of thing that you should replace before it breaks, even though they're not cheap. And mm. it's just way, way more expensive to deal with a failure than it is to replace these things when you know that it's going to break. You can put in all kinds of redundancies, but the redundancies should be there for the emergency, mm -hmm. not as the primary wait for it to fail, this will catch it, because <laughs> right. those things can fail too. So if you're going to rely on a solenoid on a never-ending water supply, make sure to replace it before it fails at least once a year. All right, so number 26, some people may know about it, but I bet you less than 1% actually do it. Yeah, the mistake here is not realizing that your wastewater is tunable you know, based off of how clean or how dirty your water is. You can actually change out the flow restrictor to get the best performance from your RO membrane. So yeah, if you only have 50 TDS in your city water supply, there's not a whole lot of hardness in there. Mm -hmm. You can probably crank the rejection rate down. Yep. Uh, and you know this is a 550, but you may be able to bring it down all the way to four or even 300 mm -hmm. and still get enough flush to keep the membrane clean. However, if you have 500 TDS water, you may want to do the opposite, maybe crank it up to 800 mm -hmm. to keep the system clean and get the most life out of your membrane. All right, so number 27 is something a lot of people actually overlook, but once you've used one, you'll absolutely be happy with it. Yeah, the mistake is not realizing the value of a three-way ball valve. By far my favorite piece of RODI equipment out there because I can have one source of water and split, not only split it into two different directions, but I can choose when it goes to one of those directions. I just love this thing. Yeah, without that, in many cases, you have a whole series or snake of different uh, on-off valves mm -hmm. to be able to do it. It's not only more expensive, but you have to remember how to do it all. It's just nice to have a really clean install and to be able to switch where the flow from your RDI system is going, as well as just turn it off. All right, so number 28, this is a never-ending water supply. <laughs> Depending on where you put it, this is an awesome option. Yeah, a uh, mistake is not using some of these low cost safety precautions with your RO, like the watchdog and the flow lock. They're, I mean, they operate simply, the watchdog, loud alarm, and the flow lock just shuts off water when you need it to. So the most common leak out of one of these things is either you use the scissors or a knife and you uh, avoided uh, our previous fail, <laughs> or you just didn't crank the canister down quite tight enough mm. and it created a small leak that you may not know about. Yep. Watchdog, 10 bucks or 12 bucks, and it will set it off an little audible alarm saying, hey, you didn't crank this thing down, there's a mm. small leak. And actually with the flow lock, there's even a tray that yep. can go right underneath it and it will collect the water and set off a float valve that will automatically turn it off. All right, so 29 is actually another one of those areas where you get the wrong tool for the wrong job, and it's kind of frustrating. There are some right uses for this, but in most cases, it's just not the right option. Yeah, and this is making the mistake of using the pen style TDS meter and relying that you have not made any errors in getting it contaminated and then trusting the results. Yeah, a lot of times the phone calls would be, I'm you know, getting the TDS in my water, and why doesn't my RO system produce zero TDS? I'm getting two, three, mm. four, or even more. 
And the reality is, is one drop of salt water was either on the pen or in the container. <laughs> and really, almost nothing you can do can really get it off because I can't rinse it with tap water. Yeah. And it's just really, really hard to get a nice, clean uh, reading out of using the pen. And that's why most people use these inline meters because the water's flowing right through it. There's no chance of contamination, instant reading, and it's just much, much easier and way harder to mess up. So number 30 is actually a way to save a lot of money but increase the performance of the system you already have. Yeah, and the mistake here is not realizing that these are upgradable modular and I can just add on pieces as I need to upgrade my system. Uh, you know, if I start with a four stage and I realize I need an extra carbon block, Boom, I add an extra canister. If I decide that uh, you know, I need more water production, I add on a water saver add-on. So I can keep adding on to this to tailor it to fit my specific needs. Yeah, you wanna add a DI resin? You just get an empty container and add one on. You can actually buy a bracket and make it like brand new. Yeah. Or you can just bolt it to the wall right next to it. If I wanna take my four stage like a value unit that only has one sediment filter, one carbon block, add one of these before, put the sediment filter in, and now I can use both of those stages for carbon blocks. Yep. So it's really, really easy to upgrade your system. There's no reason to go out there and buy a new one, regardless of the brand that you probably have. It will likely work. You can change out some of the filters to today's standards and then add in whatever you like. All right, so if there is only one takeaway from this whole thing, what is it? For me, it's the fact that these are upgradable. I'm gonna take that last one that we just did and just know that you can add on efficiency by adding on components and all I need to buy is one little piece at a time. Yeah, for me, it's make sure to change your DI resin before it's fully depleted <laughs> so you true. don't purge ammonia and silica into your tank. And if you're not the kind of person that will catch it in that last uh, half inch or so, make sure to use two resins so that the first one is depleted into the second one and you'll never have that problem and you can actually mm. get all the life out of the first one. So if you're wondering why you even use RO systems, we recently did a video and all the pollutant inputs the mm. tank and uh, fresh water is definitely one of them. So you can go check that out and see all the different areas where we're putting stuff into the tank we don't want to and we can avoid it.